26%. That's the percentage of the maximum efficiency of photosynthesis when considering the most optimal conditions required for the reaction to take place. When I first saw this number, to say I was shocked was an understatement. The oxygen that makes life on this planet possible is only 26% efficient at being made. The primary producer on Earth is only 26% efficient at being a primary producer. Let that sink in for a second. The inefficiency of photosynthesis presents a missed opportunity for the production of agricultural products that we consume. Our reliance on plants and photosynthesis on a global level is one of the primary causes that we will be a population that lacks a stable food supply by the year 2050. You might remember the one-child policy in China and its attempt to advertise and later legalize the limitation on a number of children a family can have. This was in an attempt to slow the rate of the population growth because of the fear that the population would exceed the food supply. The policy was later revoked in 2016, only about eight years ago. Although the one-child policy was effective at tanking the birth rate, it ultimately caused negative results that are still prevalent today. China's population has experienced a record low birth rate past the policy period, and as a result, nearly half of the population was between the ages of 25 and 54 in 2020. During that time period, China, or any other country, did not have the capabilities to integrate technology to solve this population issue. Arguably, this is one of the only solutions that China could have pursued with limited access to technologies that could rapidly expedite the growth of the food supply in a matter of a few decades. However, the technologies that we have today can allow us to implement different solutions for the future, especially considering the growing issue of food security. Food security, unfortunately, is becoming a global issue, and at the rate the population is growing, it could become a reality for many within the next 25 years. Upon seeing that number for the first time and the events that have been caused as a result, I became obsessed with finding a solution to this problem. We live in a time period where we are at the inflection point for discovering technologies that have the capability to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Something that I kept on seeing in the news was called CRISPR, the next big thing in biotech. CRISPR is a process that uses a bacterial enzyme to cut and induce new pieces of DNA. The enzyme was actually used as a defense mechanism for bacteria against viruses, and it was modified with the capability to genetically modify organisms' DNA dubbed as CRISPR-Cas9. This allows people to genetically modify organisms' DNA to produce modified conformations of proteins that will be passed down in the lineage of cells. CRISPR has the capability to modify genes using three very important components, a Cas9 enzyme, a guide RNA, and a template DNA molecule. The guide RNA is a piece of RNA which guides the bacterial enzyme through the DNA sequence and then allows the bacterial enzyme to cut the DNA, and the template DNA then acts as an inducer which modifies the repair process. Through the implementation of this technology, we can cure diseases that have afflicted people for hundreds of years, like sickle cell disease and even certain cancers. With the profound strides in the gene editing world, we can use genetically modifying enzymes to edit virtually any organism to produce a desired trait or product. What if we could use similar genetic engineering for plants? And that's when it finally clicked. Genetic engineering plans to improve the rate of photosynthesis and therefore prevent world hunger. According to the NIH, there are over 120 genes that we could select to modify in plants that have a direct ability to control photosynthesis. Many of these genes usually have the ability to regulate other genes, which is referred to as epistasis. This makes it difficult to implement a system to modify genes to produce an observable result because there are so many genes at play, and theoretically speaking, each gene would need a specific modification. Looking for ideas on what we could modify was a difficult process. We would often encounter genes that we found appealing only to find restrictive genes at play. We needed something that we believe could modify genes to achieve photosynthetic efficiency, while also something that would be scalable, experimentally speaking. About eight years ago, I remember working on a puzzle, like one of those 1,000-piece puzzles that was super complicated. There were always these few pieces that I had no absolute idea where they went. This project that I was working on was like that puzzle. There were days where we weren't making any progress due to the search for modifications that were feasible to carry out. One day, the puzzle clicked, and that was the day we looked at something outside of the biochemical pathway itself, rather at one of the first steps of photosynthesis. 
the absorption of photons from the environment is a step in the process where inefficiencies rise due to a lack of pigment diversity. By implementing a more diverse variety of pigments, we believe that we could increase the rate of photosynthesis. Essentially, the basis of the idea was that pigments have an absorption spectrum, which essentially looks at the rate of photosynthesis or absorption in different wavelengths of light. If you think about it, color is just a wavelength of light measured in nanometers. So with this principle, we thought that if we could promote pigment diversity and therefore increase the absorption spectrum of photosynthesis, then we could potentially solve world hunger. With this idea in mind, we worked to concoct agrobacterium, a process with similar properties to CRISPR, and worked to combine it with the gene and therefore inject it into the plant, hoping to see patches of red pigment scattered throughout the plant. And that's exactly what we saw after observing our experimental population for over a week. Then we encountered our next challenge in observing whether our modifications were impactful on the rate of photosynthesis. How are we going to go about quantifying the productivity of these plants into data that can help us indicate the rate of photosynthesis? That was a question we thought we had answered, and we stuck the plants in airtight containers for about four hours with a carbon dioxide sensor so that we could track the rate of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is essential to creating sugars that photosynthesis requires for various processes like structural support and metabolic pathways. So in a closed environment without significant passage of air, we would expect that photosynthesis would cause a decrease of air in the chamber. However, we kept on seeing the air spike and drop over those four hour periods, which completely deviated from what we were initially expecting. After much thought, we took the plants out of the chambers and they were all completely limp. We would come to later realize that this was a result of photorespiration, a protective measure that plants take when they're in environments with little to no light or CO2. We had a serious flaw in the experimentation process where we had failed to account for the necessary concentration of CO2 that was required in the environment to allow photosynthesis to occur. We went back to the drawing board to find reactions that could perform and release CO2 to allow us to conduct our experiment in a manner that could allow us to collect data from the plants that we were testing. Our search to find this reaction was found in our homes, which was baking soda and vinegar, which form carbon dioxide. With the second attempt, we allowed the reaction to take place, then placed the plants within the chamber. And at that point, we had received results to show that modifying pigments does increase photosynthetic capabilities. And after a few rounds of statistical tests, we were able to further support this claim. I didn't come here today to only talk to you about my dreams to use gene editing to solve world hunger. I also came here to talk to you about what is in this room, and that's you all. I'm confident that you all have some sort of passion or ambition that you want to accomplish in your life or see done. Just because we are young doesn't mean that we shouldn't go out and follow our passions. We live in a world where age limits are slowly fading and we can be taken seriously. We should take advantage of this changing view of the youth and follow the journey that our dreams take us on. I read a quote by Elon Musk that said that most people will panic to find a charger before their phone dies, but won't panic to find a plan before their dream dies. The culture that we have created about following dreams is associated with such a negative connotation. It is seen as something that is not financially supportive, risky, and comes with a high failure rate. For us young people, it's not being taken seriously or not being supported due to our age. Change comes over time, and even with this changing view of how the youth is looked at, it is difficult to change the mindsets of many, but that doesn't mean your dream should die. We should work to learn the most about what we can in the areas that we're passionate about and take the initiative to accomplish those dreams. Your dream is something that you don't have to feel enjoyment out of every single day you go to work on that particular project. Failure in any way or form is imminent, but if anything, it's the failure that serves as the catalyst for improvement. Failure is where you see the pitfall, and with the pitfall comes the opportunity for change. The first time I ran my experiment before the data collection process, I remember injecting the plant with the gene only to see one red dot in the center of the leaf. That singular dot stayed there for months, and we saw absolutely no signs of improvement. With the deviation in results, we reevaluated our procedures, and without that failure, we wouldn't have been able to catch those flaws to construct the best possible experimental setup we could. And turns out, those changes played a crucial role in scaling our experiment to a much larger level. Failure is not something to enjoy, and it's really hard to as a matter of fact. What we can do is accept that it's there and that it is imminent. Talking to a lot of people my age, I saw a common answer that people had about the reason why we don't take our passions to the next level. 
And I heard something along the lines of, I could consider it as an adult or I won't be taken seriously. If we continue to stay within the limits that society has created about the youth, how can we expect a different result? We can't. We are the ones responsible for shaping the next 100 years of the future. And let's make those next 100 years different from the last. We can start by changing the culture around innovation. Let's prioritize our dreams over the phone charger, even as young people. Because young people still have dreams and passions, and they deserve to be heard. Thank you.